All right. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> hello, hello. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. We just want to make sure that everyone has enough time to join us because we got a lot of people uh, who are planning on attending tonight. Um, but if the meantime, if while we wait for the room to fill up, if you want to drop in the chat and let us know where you're joining from, we always like to hear that. Mm, you can let us know where you're joining from or how you heard about the event. That's always uh, personally useful for me. Wow, hello from Brazil. Welcome, welcome. Williamsburg, thanks for coming tonight. Nashville. Welcome, DC, Staten Island, Australia. Geez, it's like tomorrow or yesterday there. I can never tell which one. Some New Jersey, Brooklyn, Duncanville, Texas, Forest Hills, Midwood, the Bronx. Upstate. I don't know what you did to promote this event, Salvador, but <laughs> something worked. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I'm delighted to hear that there's so many uh, people joining us from today. Yeah, I'd love to hear how you heard about this event because yeah, this is fantastic. Email from Eventbrite, maps are cool. Thomas, you're absolutely right. We're gonna talk about just how cool they are soon. Nashville, born and raised in Manhattan, welcome. Transit Museum, thank you. Wonderful, seems like a good mix of um, Transit Museum and Poster House fans. We love to see that. Salvador, Poster House and the Transit Museum are a winning combination. I couldn't agree more. I like to hear that. <laughs> Wonderful. Wow, we have a lot of mutual fans. I love to, I'm so delighted to hear that. Again, because this event was so popular, we're going to give it just a few more minutes before we get started. <laughs> wow well thank you all so much for tuning in tonight again we're going to get started in just a few short minutes um i'm really really excited for tonight's program um and i know you all are too um we just want to make sure that everybody who's registered has the chance to join us Oh, and be sure to set your chat to everyone so that everyone can see um, your comments and I don't look like I'm just talking to myself or making up these locations. <laughs> I so Sal Salvador, I have to tell you that some of the people who have outed themselves in the chat are uh, map experts. And so if I make a mistake, you are definitely going to hear about it. Uh-oh. <laughs> no pressure, though. <laughs> No mistakes, just learning opportunities. That's a good way to look at it. <laughs> all right, and we're going to give it one more minute. People are still filing in. I'm not surprised at all. Uh, very popular tonight. Um, and we're going to get started in just one minute. All right, so I still see people filing in the room, but in the interest of time, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so 
I'm going to go ahead and kick us off, and then I'm going to hand it over to our brilliant panelists, who are the people that you are here to see. Uh, so hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Salvador Munoz, and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Outreach at Poster House, which is, of course, the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. I am so excited to welcome you to tonight's program, Vignelli versus Vigilantes, Art versus Design, uh, presented in partnership with the New York Transit Museum. Uh, tonight's program will explore the commonalities of two very different exhibitions, Poster House's Mass Vigilantes on Silent Motorbikes and the New York Transit Museum's Towards a Better Way, the Vignelli Map at 50. First, Poster House guest curator RJ Rushmore will share, with, will share a bit about Poster House's first contemporary art exhibition. Uh, then New York Transit Museum curator Jody Shapiro will discuss the development of the MTA's iconic identity. Lastly, Mass Vigilantes artist Jilly Ballistic will show her work remixing the MTA's timeless designs. Uh, this program will conclude with a Q&A with all three panelists, so be sure to have your questions ready to go. Um, before we get started, I did just want to share a few notes on accessibility for this program. Uh, automated closed captioning is available for those who need or prefer it, and you can turn it on or off by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be made available for all registered attendees after the event. And lastly, if you have any questions during the program, you can drop them in the question, you can drop them in the Q&A box or in the chat, and I'll go ahead and vocalize them for you. Again, just make sure that your chat is set to everyone so that it doesn't look like I'm talking to myself or just making things up. Um, and so now that I've gotten uh, all of that out of the way, I am going to hand it over to our panelists, the first of which is going to be RJ. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Salvador. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. So I'm going to start out. I'm RJ Rushmore. I'm going to start out with a quick plug for Masked Vigilantes on Silent Motorbikes, which is open now at Poster House through February 12th. Uh, this is an exhibition that's been open for a few months now. You know, Poster House normally is a museum that consists of posters. It's right there in the name. And if you've been there before, you've probably noticed that. Um, these are design objects, historical documents. We're going to talk a lot about design objects tonight. Um, Mass Vigilantes is a bit different in that it's not just an exhibition of posters, but posters as art or as design objects, but of artists who have uh, taken, found, and modified posters for any number of reasons. And we'll get into some of that tonight. So really work that speaks to, uh, by repurposing the work, really speaks to the poster's ability to communicate with society and be a symbol for, or be be touchstones for, for society. So, and mass culture. So, uh, so one of the docents at Poster House put this really well. They said, uh, posters typically present uh, a clear statement, or maybe they demand a specific action, you know, buy this watch, whatever. Uh, posters provide answers, art asks questions. So we're going to start tonight by looking at some art. Um, and I'll say my background is in street art, graffiti, public arts. So we're going to talk a little bit about some exhibitions, some objects that are in the exhibition, but also uh, the relationship between those objects and public space. Um, very quickly, uh, this is... Uh, well, let's start with why we want to intervene in the subway. Now, Jilly, this is a work by Jilly Ballistic, who will, this is the piece that she has, they have in Poster House, and I'm sure Jilly will speak more to it. Uh, but when you think about this piece here, we have a, a poster from the MTA, and you could imagine Jilly intervening on this piece with, with these, these archival photographs and putting it back up on the streets in the subway, right? Now, why do this? Why work with materials from the subway system? Um, I'll let Jilly explain why they work with those materials, but more broadly, first of all, Subway is a public space that the whole city interacts with, so artists, you know, they want attention, right? <laughs> why not interact in that space? Um, additionally, like, let's face it, the MTA's graphics are really iconic, and we're going to hear a lot more about that uh, tonight, but the you know as an artist you want to draw potentially from existing mass culture because you can it's easily identifiable and then suddenly okay now i can i can start at this starting point of um this image that everybody recognizes put my twist on it 
And now suddenly people are paying attention to my thing, right? I mean, it's an oversimplification and it sounds maybe a bit, uh, a bit self-centered, but maybe it is a bit self-centered. Um, additionally, and we're gonna see this through just about everything I show tonight, there, there is maybe an element of protest, right? If you're an artist and you're working in public space uh, without permission, as a lot of the artists that I'm gonna show are or were, um, you know, as particularly on uh, advertising, which other than this piece by Jilly, everything we're gonna see was on advertising, you know, maybe you're not such a fan of the idea that our subways are covered in ads. Maybe buying a magazine and seeing an advertisement, you've kind of opted into that idea, right? That an advertisement, like that's part of the deal. A magazine costs $5 because there's a bunch of ads in it. With no ads, it might cost 20 bucks. Um, on the other hand, in the subway, this is kind of unavoidable, right? I can decide not to buy a magazine or not watch TV, but if I have to get to work, I have to expose myself to all of that imagery on the subway. Um, and so many of the artists I'm about to show you are using art to draw attention to that. Uh, it's called a situation. They might call it a problem. And I'll let, I'll, again, I'll let Jilly speak to that uh, as an artist who does that kind of work. Um, so one of the artists that, that we'll see in, you'll see in Mass Vigilantes, this guy, Michael DeFeo, um so I'll start start here this is a this is a piece that is in mass vigilantes is in poster house right now uh this is a piece it's a it's a bus shelter advertisement that michael took and he uh, has painted on it these these flowers it was an ad for misty or perfume and if you look very closely you'll still be able to see the perfume bottle sort of uh, in the center, just sort of below, you can sort of see Natalie Portman's hands holding this obscured perfume bottle. But he's painted all these flowers on it. And this particular work was always intended to be in a gallery setting. Um, but, uh, you know, it no, it no longer looks or feels like an ad, right? It really, Michael has inserted Natalie Portman into, into his world and responded to the ad too, right? He's pulling these pinks out of the ad. He's responding to sort of these flowery vines or weaving up uh, Portman's face. It's not totally random flowers, but um, it's a beautiful painting, but like why, right? Like why borrow these subway ads? Well, Michael started this series by actually painting on the ads and installing them back on the street. Um, and so this was, this was not in New York, this was in Amsterdam, but you can imagine a similar thing in bus shelter ads in New York City. And you know, again, he's he's he has this world of Michael draws a lot of flowers. He's known as the flower guy, um, and he's he's bringing the advertisements into his world and at the same time obscuring the products. Imagine walking down the street, and rather than being sold at a very expensive perfume, you just have this beautiful flowery scene, right? But it's still it is very beautiful. Like the fashion ads, the photography is worth appreciating, right? And so he's maybe proposing a different way that we can use our public spaces um, that might be more pleasant for some of us, let's say. Um, another artist here is maybe a little more aggressive, a little more uh, anti-advertising, uh, Caroline Caldwell. Uh, I should say that um, with Mass Vigilantes, the show is split into a few sections. Addition, something like Michael or Jilly, where they're adding work, uh, you know, painting or collaging on top of an existing ad subtraction, which is what we're going to see here and for, I think, Caroline and the next artist, and then multiplication, where an artist is kind of remixing multiple found posters. So, sorry, I should have said that up top, but Caroline's work, this is an image you might have seen before. It went very viral. Madonna has used it to sell tickets to her tour and things like this. AOC has quoted it. Um, this was uh, on a Metro North train, uh, I think about 10 years ago. Uh, the artist took a a poster, an advertisement that was in the train and flipped it around, drew this, this quote, this, this little aphorism uh, on the back of uh, whatever the advertisement was. We don't, she doesn't remember what it was, uh, but for whatever it was advertising and put it back and just took this photo and left. And, you know, she was living up on the Metro North line at the time, just the train kept going, right? And maybe a few people saw that there realistically, 99% of people who have ever seen this saw it in a photograph, but it's an interesting proposition, right? To take these ads, remove them from the, our, our view and maybe propose a different solution. Uh, this is what you'll see in Poster House. You can actually see in this photo, both Jilly's work and Michael's and Caroline's 
in a payphone, um, this work was uh, was is on the back of an advertisement for, uh, that was originally in a New York City payphone, uh, advertising uh, essentially a freeze the fat off place. So rather than being told that I need to get rid of my beer belly, uh, we have Caroline flipping that around and saying, this is public infrastructure. I have some amount of right to how I experience public space. I think public space is interesting and should be you know, pleasant for people and putting that in a society quote back, back up there. Um, and for those who, who can't quite read it, it's uh, the line is in a society that profits from your self-doubt, liking yourself is a rebellious act. Um, and I think it's a nice uh, sentiment. And I think it's really interesting to see it in these settings that do feel very official, right? Like that, even that sign, even though it's hand painted with a marker or, or here with the, in the payphone with the sort of classic bell uh, payphone structure and, and the blue phone text, you know, feels somewhat official, even though it's very clearly not. Um, so I really love that. Um, this is another side of that payphone here. Another side, no bad days. Um, and lastly, in this section, we have Jordan Seiler. Um, so Jordan, uh, really fantastic artist and really interesting. He's been working probably for 20 years in, uh, in public space, in the subways, on bus shelters, uh, really all over the world. Um, but thinking about our relationship with public infrastructure and also advertising as it relates to that. So in this case, you have a bus shelter and JC Deco many years ago, essentially made agreements with governments throughout the city or throughout the world. And I'm going to oversimplify this, but essentially said, we'll build you some bus shelters if we can put advertising in them and we'll build these really nice bus shelters, but we're going to, you know, we're going to sell you things. And maybe that was a good compromise. Maybe it wasn't right. Um, but it, it was the compromise that many cities around the world have made. And as a result, our cities have all this advertising. Um, and so Jordan's work has often been about questioning that relationship and challenging it and saying, like, really, should JC Co be responsible for building our public infrastructure or should the MTA be responsible for it? And should we just, you know, have higher taxes on, on certain people or, or higher fares to build this kind of public infrastructure? because it's essential to what being in a city is, right? Um, so this is a poster, obviously, for The Queen's Gambit, a uh, big Netflix show from a few years ago uh, in a bus shelter, I think, in New York City. Um, this is one of Jordan's pieces as it exists in Mass Vigilantes. Um, so it is just that poster cropped and then backlit um, and installed back in the gallery without any branding. And I really love this piece um, and this series it's called Selections because he is going into public space, selecting a poster that he says, this is appealing, right? Like that's a, that's a great photograph, but right now it's trying to sell me on a TV show, right? But what if it wasn't? What if we just focused on this woman's gaze and the beautiful photograph that it is and the makeup and the hair and all of the creative energy that went into creating this thing to tell you to go on on Netflix, right? And if we just take all that away, we actually still have a really compelling image. In fact, we have a more compelling image would be Jordan's uh, argument. Um, so that's what he's he's put up in the gallery uh, in Poster House right now, which I find really funny as like a poster museum that he's, that might be a poster that Poster House would show anyways. And he's just cropped away all the branding and said, but I made it better. <laughs> and um, this is uh, another piece from, from Jordan from that same series. This was an American horror story ad um and you can see he's cropped it away and it's a sort of sort of creature from the black lagoon vibes and again same concept cropped away all the branding and made us really reconsider um you know the a how we use our public spaces and be the public energy that goes into these these ads that are such a critical part of our public space um and lastly i want to get into the subway system get into the mta and i'm going to say all of these images for anybody at the mta anybody transit museum these images are like a decade old or more, so uh, important context. Um, so lastly, I want to talk about uh, a, an artist called Poster Boy. Um, and Poster Boy, uh, my text here, Poster Boy, and these, this is, we're getting into that multiplication section I was talking about now of artists who are collaging, remixing from multiple sources, 
and really working with posters and other elements of public space in, in a way where they can recombine and recontextualize things to make them greater than the sum of their original parts. So Poster Boy describes themselves as a movement, a decentralized group of vandals and activists. They've taken on advertising infrastructure, uh, particularly within the New York subway system for 10, 15 years now. And uh, the examples I'm going to show you, like I said, are quite old. They'll be from the group's most active period about a decade ago. Um, this one I love. Uh, this McDonald's ad, uh, or is it a McDonald's ad? I think it was a Comedy Central show, right? About those like clowns in a hospital or something. And he's rem they've removed all the branding from that and just added a McDonald's logo. And it totally, and again, it's in the subway system. This is in the New York City subway system. So it's sort of, this isn't in a gallery. This is people seeing this in public space, seeing it for 10 seconds at a time and passing by. And what a terrifying McDonald's ad it is. And yet terrifyingly accurate. Um, and so I really, I don't know, I love this piece as an example of how Poster Boy could take just, just with a simple razor blade, go into the subway system, cut out an element from one ad, put it in another, completely change the meaning. Um, and I think, you know, this speaks to his, their interest in doing this, right, speaks to the, the importance of what's going on in our subway system. It is one of the great public spaces of, of our city. Um, another example from Poster Boy uh, during sort of Occupy Wall Street era, um, using some of the uh, amazing mosaics in the Wall Street station and combining that with some advertisements and uh, possibly some things that he, he, he and the group made at home, I'm not sure, but essentially this, this nice little maybe taking the chase card from uh, from an actual chase advertisement in the subway, changing it to say cheat, and maybe taking the dollars from another ad, um, slapping them together on wall uh, at the Wall Street stop. Um, and now you might think, well, that's weird. That's not where ads go in the subway, right? Um, but not all ads in the subway are like these on the, you know, right here on the in the sort of frames, right? Oftentimes you'll find, that ads in the subway also end up interacting with um, with the infrastructure that's part of the subway system, right? With the rest of, I mean, this ad here for American Dad, you know, you still, they still, you can see that it kind of goes up to here right below the windows, but they still had to cut out this space so that the do not lean on the door section. So here you have really the MTA's graphical language mixing and the architecture of the, or the the architecture, what would you call it? The 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 subway itself, the subway car itself, mixing with this ad, right? For American Dad, um, so Poster Boy took that and they switched it around a little bit, <laughs> and we went from "It will blow you away, American Dad" to uh, "It will blow American Ad" uh, with really just a razor blade, right? A razor blade, maybe some duct tape, maybe taking that gray from another similar American dad ad and maybe taking that gun from another ad. And I love, you know, how this, this work and a lot of poster boys work really highlights the violence that exists in a lot of subway advertising that we see um, that, you know, you don't really think about it. And then you realize, oh my God, I just saw ads for like 10 action movies today and they all had these big guns in them. And I'm just trying to get to, you know, how does that how does that affect you in the same way that like a beautifully designed, you know, Wall Street mosaic maybe improves your day or a, a, an effective map or effective signage is going to improve your day? How does seeing 10 ads for an action movie affect your day, even subconsciously, I think is a question that Poster Boy's work really raises. And a lot of people who work in the subway, their work really raises, I think Jilly's as well. Um, so lastly, I'll just show you what Poster Boy did for Poster House which is this piece in the corner here, uh, El Pio. It is made of found billboards. You can see this in the museum and walk around it and get up close to it, walk on it even. And uh, these are found billboards, not from the subway system, but from New York. Uh, yeah, found somehow, somehow appeared in their possession. And uh, then now you have them sort of spilling out of the guts of the museum, like like Poster Boy is like hacked into this museum and, and posters just spilled out. So... I'm sorry, I'm over time, so I'll I'll shut up and uh, move on to Jody. I think. Uh, 
but that's that's mass vigilantes in a nutshell and how maybe we relate to the mta i hope you'll check it out this is like a tiny fraction of what's in the show um and i'm sure julie will speak more to that as well thanks okay Here. Uh, so that was pretty, pretty enlightening, RJ. Um, I, I remember the poster boy uh, actions from years ago and uh, was always pretty intrigued by them while I was commuting to and from work uh, and, and actually wondered who was behind them. So you've, you've shed a little light on that, which is pretty good. Um, you also talked about how the wayfinding and signage and uh, there's the MTA and the New York subway system has this iconic identity. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, Unimark's impact on New York City's transit identity. Um, and this is a system that was implemented in the late 19, 1960s, and it's still impacts on what we see today when we go use any New York City transit that's Subway, bus, Metro North, Long Island Railroad, they're all part of the same team, so to speak, and uh, all follow basically the same rules, even though they may not look exactly the same all the time. Uh, just a little brief about the Transit Museum. Uh, we opened in 1976. Uh, we became the New York Transit Museum in the 80s. We're located in a decommissioned IND subway station in beautiful downtown Brooklyn. Uh, we also have a gallery and shop in Grand Central Terminal, and we have programs for all ages. Uh, so, uh, I mentioned Unimark at the top, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit what happened, what, what was there before Unimark. So, New York's transit system of today is basically the amalgam over time of dozens of transportation companies who all had their own wayfinding and signage standards. Uh, the eventual merging of those dozens of companies into about four or five larger companies. Uh, there were changing aesthetics and tastes from the turn of the century onward. Uh, more resilient materials evolved from wood and uh, wood and paint, which was what a lot of the signage was in the very early days. Uh, and as more people use transportation, the companies had a better understanding of what customers wanted and needing needed in their transportation wayfinding systems. And that came from listening to feedback. So here is a photograph of uh, Lexington Avenue, 59th Street, that was taken uh, many years after unification happened, which I will talk a little bit about in a future slide. Uh, and so this is that slide from then, and this is a slide of almost the same staircase that I took in 2019. And I'm just gonna flip back. So you can see, this is a whole bunch of signage telling you to go into a million different places, and they all seem to be up the same staircase. Uh, and here it is where there is a security warning in the center of the staircase. If you see something, say something, uh, an indication of what station you're at and, uh, at the top, which subway lines are up the stairs. So unification, uh, which is the merging of the three big companies that ran the subway system. Uh, they also ran surface transit. So that's the IRT, which is Interborough Rapid Transit, BMT, Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Corporation, IND Independent System, which was city owned. It happens in 1940 and it's only on paper because the physical unification of these systems takes a long time and it's still going on today. Um, when unification happened in 1940, there were efforts to inform the customers of unification, but they were very spotty. It was sort of understood that this is what was happening, even though there wasn't like a lot of signage to indicate that um, much like today where uh, we're we uh, the transit authority is phasing in a new fare payment system called Omni. And there are signs and advertisements all over the place telling you as a customer, hey, Omni is here, or Omni is coming to the station, or Omni is going to be on your bus line. That sort of effort didn't really happen with unification. Uh, also, you know, New York was smaller back then, and there were less things for to advertise to people about unification. So it's a societal change and an actual physical change. Uh, however, even the New York City Transit Authority still refers to these three predecessor agencies, the IRT, the BMT, and the IND, 
which is kind of hilarious to me because how can you ex- expect customers to refer to it as the New York City subway or the MTA if you yourself are referring to the subway as the IRT or the BMT? Uh, and so there's there's a more is more approach to information in this era. Uh, and before I talk about Unimark's system, I need to talk about three people whose work paved the way for it. Uh, and so you've got this gentleman here in the glasses. This is George Solomon. This gentleman in the center, Raleigh Diadamo. And last but certainly not least, uh, Stanley Goldstein. And uh, so starting with George Solomon, uh, he's a graphic designer. He took a holistic approach to the subway. And uh, what he did was compiled his extensive notes into something called Out of the Labyrinth. And he sent it unsolicited to the New York City Transit Authority, which is the agency that runs the subway and most of our bus system. And as a result of Out of the Labyrinth, the authority hired George Solomon to redesign the subway map. And uh, it, it is thought by us at the Transit Museum and other design experts that Solomon's proposal was probably among the ones that Unimark referred to while they were making their own design study of New York. Um, And then there's this great quote about Solomon, about the the system circa 1957. The subway system has now reached a point where only an expert can find his way around it. And this is the map uh, that he eventually designed for the authority. And it is uh, the first map produced in-house by the New York City Transit Authority in 1958, which eliminated editorializing by third parties. Uh, Before that, most maps were uh, issued from banks or from hotels and, you know, their hotel was smack dab in the middle of the graphic field, you know, points of interest, things like that. Hagstrom and uh, Rand McNally made their own maps. This is the first authority issued map. So there is no real points of interest. It's more like just the facts, like here's where you transfer, here's the IND, here's the BMT, here's, here's the IRT, even though unification happened 18 years before they're still referring to these predecessor agencies. Uh, It's uh, the first subway map for New York that uses a Beckian grid uh, named for Harry Beck, who is the draftsman who standardized London Underground's map. Uh, And this resulted in a much clearer and more useful travel aid. Next, we have Raleigh Diadamo. uh, And Raleigh is, is a character. I've gotten to speak with him many times and I just love him. Uh, He was a lawyer who entered a contest to improve the subway map in 1964. He was one of four winners. And because he won this contest, he has devoted the rest of his life pretty much to being a transit guru. Uh, He was he was the head of the Westchester County Transportation Agency in the 70s and 80s. Uh, He worked for the New York City Transit Authority and the MTA. Um, and has a lot of very good and interesting opinions about subway de-interlining. Uh, and uh, Vignelli and Norda from Unimark definitely do refer to his studies in their research. Um, and Raleigh's big push was to uh, expand the color palette. Uh, and instead of using just three colors, that they should use more colors than that, because three colors was just confusing. And he's a very handsome looking man in this uh, photo. Uh, We have some other ones of him like showing his map and, you know, it's just, he's just such a great person. And then Stanley Goldstein, uh, who published a paper called Methods of Improved Subway Information in 1965. Um, He discusses the importance of color and using sans serif typefaces to maximize the ease of information delivery to customers. Uh, The color system that he suggested was called the Munsell color system. Uh, Vignelli and Norda, Norda also refer to Goldstein's research in their, uh, in their um, proposals to the New York City Transit Authority. And Stanley also has a great quote. The transit system has maps, platform signs, train signs, light paths, loudspeaker systems, and timetables. In spite of all these aids, the non-commuter finds it difficult to find his way to his destination. So where does that leave us? So in 1964, uh, there's a federal law that's passed the mass federal mass uh, urban uh, the urban mass transportation act, and this is the first time that New York City's transit system will get an infusion of federal funds. 
Uh, and so the Metropolitan Commuter Transportation Authority issues this plan in uh, 1968 called a program for action. And it is a multi-million dollar multi-year plan to improve the New York City area's transportation system using these federal funds. Uh, and so later, uh, this is this was uh, published in February and in March of that year, they drop commuter and become the MTA. So happy birthday MTA in 1968, it's born. And now here the problems begin. So <laughs> you've got the imminent for formation of the MTA. Uh, you've got New York City Transit Authority who runs the subways and buses, like I said. They have some major construction projects that are going to dramatically change the subway system beginning in like 1966, 1967. And the confluence of these two events requires a holistic approach needed, needed to be taken for so many desperate parts of our transportation system that some new wayfinding needed to be uh, devised. And so Unimark International is hired to devise this wayfinding system in 1966. And uh, so lots of you might be familiar with this book. It is called the New York City Transit Authority Graphic Standards Manual, and uh, also known as the Bible. Uh, it not only codified what signage would look like, but how it was going to be constructed, where it would be placed, and uh, there's a great quote in here that says, the passenger will be given the information or direction only at the point of decision, never before, never after. Uh, and there's three basic categories of signs, identification, directional, and informational. Uh, here's uh, some sample pages, which uh, are pretty fascinating. So one is just like uh, how, how to get there. This was part of uh, the Unimark plan was if you wanted to go to Alabama Avenue, these were the trains that you would take to get there. This unfortunately was never implemented within the system. Um, and then here is a typical building of signs and like how they would be, how they would be manufactured by the sign shop. Uh, and there's some very strict rules about these signs. The New York City, the New York subway by its very nature is full of environmental differences. It is vital that all deviations from, from the Manual of Standards be referred to the New York City Transit Authority Signs Committee for consideration so that any digression from the recommended norm will be done with the greatest discretion. Since this comprehensive and improved signage program requires consistency, there must be no overlapping of old and new signs. And so Unimark were very strict about that. Uh, by the way, um, this is a uh, blueprint of the typeface that was used for signs beginning when the Unimark system was implemented. It is not Helvetica. It is accidents grotesque. Uh, Helvetica was not used at the outset of this new wayfinding system because Unimark felt that Helvetica was not 100% effective for transportation signage uh, due to some optical issues with kerning and with uh, some of the X heights and negative space between the letters which made it confusing at a distance. This is the quote from the standards manual. Research has shown that the most appropriate typeface for this purpose is a regular sans serif of the various weights of sans serif available. Standard medium has been found to offer the easiest legibility from any angle, whether the passenger is standing, walking, or riding. So as more digital sign making tools adopted the similar looking Helvetica, as uh, it became the replacement for standard. Um, and so uh, Helvetica became the official typeface of the New York City subway in 1989, but you can still find standard signs. Uh, you can still find uh, standard signs in the system if you look carefully. Uh, so this is the quote that I just read before. I forgot I left the slide in, so I don't need you to, to sit and read it again. <laughs> uh, but here, this is what we're here to talk about really is uh, the Unimark subway diagram. Uh, people call it the Vignelli map. Uh, this is the first iteration of it from 1972. You can tell because if you look here, this is the Third Avenue elevated right here, which was demolished uh, in 1973. 
And so these color designations had already been chosen uh, by the transit authority a couple of years earlier because of the Christie Street connection, which was one of the big service changes I mentioned before that required a new wayfinding system. Uh, and you're looking at this and you're saying, but Jody, that's that's the Unimark map. Uh, that's the Vignelli map. Why are you calling it the Unimark map? And there is a method to my madness here because of this woman right here. This is Joan Charison, uh, pictured here in 1972. She was one of Unimark's designers, and she was a key player in not only the development of the standards manual, but the design of the subway diagram that has come to be called the Vignelli map. Um, she is a wonderful person. Uh, she did a lot of the heavy lifting for this map. Um, and she was so good at it that once she stopped working for Unimark, she came right over to the MTA and made a similar diagrammatic map of the commuter rail system and did a lot of other wayfinding and mapping projects for the authority. And the reason why I'm pointing her out, especially here, is because she has been systematically been left out of the conversation about this diagram for years um and you know i had considered myself something of a head about this map and i read this great book about uh vignelli and the map uh, by peter lloyd and uh he mentioned joan charison and i'm like i need to know everything i everything i can about her so she is one of the people that is uh first and foremost in our exhibit at the transit museum because she needs her due like yesterday so joan charison uh, so, <laughs> um, now that we have this iconic subway diagram and we have all of these colors, which are here visible on the left side of your screen from 1972, um, in 1979, the, uh, colors get reshuffled once again to the colors that everybody is kind of familiar with now. Um, there, uh, there's less of them. And they're, the lines are all grouped together in a certain way. And this was mostly an operational thing, not so much of a uh, visual aesthetic. Uh, but, you know, all of these colors, but mostly the post-1979 colors are the official colors of the MTA. And a lot of the communication that is uh, authored by the authority comes in these colors because they are the subway bullets. Um, these are some 1967 to uh, 1968 bullets with some service designations that some of you may or may not remember and here are more uh more recent ones although uh double letters were eliminated in 1985 so uh the qb and the cc may not be familiar to you um but it is because of these colors that were introduced with the the unimark map and the subway bull you know the and the subway bullet itself are pretty much the icons of New York City transit. Uh, the effectiveness of this system, it stands the test of time uh, and technology, and it's just as iconic as the subway token. And you know, I've used the word iconic a lot, but whenever you show somebody a subway bullet, even if it has a designation in it that is not an actual subway line, people immediately think New York City. And that's, you know, that's kind of incredible that, you know, some people in 1966 cooked this up. Um, so these colors get used in communications, like I said, and um, in informational signage and all of that. And uh, some of that informational signage has been remixed by Jilly Ballistic. So I'm going to kick it over to Jilly right now uh, once I figure out how to stop sharing. <laughs> Thanks, Jody. The perfect timing. They're shutting the lights on me. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Uh, thank you. That was incredible. That was a huge wealth of knowledge. That was amazing. Great job. Uh, RJ, great job as well. That was incredible. Uh, Salvador, thanks for introducing all of us uh, earlier. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd, you know, take a few minutes uh, on this portion to um, bring the artist's point of view. Uh, so I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce myself, who I am, what I do, how I do it, uh, and why of all places I've chosen to uh, use the subway to make my interventions. Um, so uh, yes, I'm Jilly Ballistic, and for the past 12 years or so, I've been uh, pasting printed images uh, <laughs> to site-specific areas within the New York City subway system. Uh, that includes platforms, inside train cars, 
on seats, advertisements, walls, vending machines. Uh, if it's down there, uh, it's game. You could you could work with it. So I'm going to share my screen here, just to give you an idea, if you're not familiar. All right, there we go. So let me pull up one piece. Yeah. So as you can tell, uh, my signature is the gas mask. And there's a few reasons why uh, this object eventually came to be so. Uh, but what I want to do is actually start from the beginning because it didn't just happen overnight. <laughs> um, way, way back in 2010, uh, I was a short story writer. And I still consider myself a writer. Uh, and at that time, I had several books that I had self-published under my pen name. And because I'm weird, uh, I literally printed and bound each book myself. I didn't want an agent. I didn't want a publishing house. Um, I just wanted to be an independent writer. And I wanted to go about promoting the work in a way that was more unconventional. So I did what any sensible uh, born and raised New Yorker would do in their 20s. Uh, and I chose graffiti. <laughs> um, hold on one second. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, I'll just pull this up. Uh, so I took excerpts from my stories and I wrote them on trash on the side of the street. Uh, anything, anything large, stoves, old fridges, ceiling fans, uh, chairs. Uh, basically, I paired the object with, with, uh, with the sentence. And I used crinks and spray paint and you know all the traditional graffiti stuff. And you know, long story short, people in the neighborhoods they loved it. They just love the work. And uh, that's kind of when I got bitten by the street art bug. And uh, I'll be honest, <laughs> uh, I can't draw for shit. Uh, I have no formal visual arts training. Uh, I just know that I'm really passionate about visual art and it's just something I love. I just know, I just knew that I wanted to make stuff and put it up. So although I can't paint or draw in a conventional sense, I knew I had some some skills, some talents, and that was uh, when it came to history, political science, and you know, just New York ballsiness. <laughs> I feel like I can do anything if I need to. Uh, so I used the tools that I had, uh, which was a printer, also, and um, you know, the endless source of images, which is the internet. And um, honestly, I think anything I could possibly imagine is probably already uh, an historical image. I would just have to find it. And I wanted to focus, um, I wanted to focus on the American military industrial complex and the failures of leadership. Um, I wanted to focus on climate change and all, you know, all the light, lighthearted stuff. <laughs> um, so in my research and in my deep dives, uh, one object just kept resurfacing over and over and over again, no matter what the decade was, uh, no matter what the country of origin uh, of the source material was. It, was. it was this gas mask kept coming up. And uh, I just found it as like the perfect symbol for, you know, humanity's fuck ups um, and failed policies. Like this, this is it. Uh, so after I found my signature style, uh, I... Uh, I had to think about where I wanted to put it and how. <laughs> uh, and this is where the subway comes in. And honestly, I I can't not use the subway as as a New Yorker. It's a part of your life. It's an extension of your home. It's in your it, it's in your day to day. It's nearly impossible to survive without it. And um, it's just uh, it's beautiful of course, and it's also disgusting. <laughs> it's fascinating. Uh, there's literally no place like it on earth. Um, is, is, so I was like, it's perfect. And it's something I use every day and it's constantly changing. And like RJ noted, it's, uh, you're, you're gonna get attention uh, because of the thousands, literally thousands upon thousands of people that use it. Um, but the subway is a completely different animal uh, a completely different universe from the street. So, I mean, there's like surveillance, right? There's uniformed cops, there's plainclothes cops, there's 
random strangers. <laughs> you don't know who you're going to be dealing with. Um, so uh, I just knew that I had to uh, work fast and traditional materials. Uh, when you're working with paper, you use wheat, something called wheat pasting, which is basically just think of Elmer's glue and like a lot of it. And that's not going to work down there. You can't you can't bring buckets of paint and brushes. It's too conspicuous. It takes forever to dry. Uh, so I had to, you know, overcome some roadblocks again. So I had to adapt to it. And uh, so I did what any uh, sensible lesbian would do. And I went to Home Depot. <laughs> and for real, I went to the Home Depot off uh, 6th Avenue. And they have an entire aisle dedicated to adhesives. And that's where I found it. I found... Uh, uh, I had my aha moment, basically. I could, I found something small that could fit in my bag that was affordable, that it dries quickly, that it's silent. Um, so I want to show you what I mean by this. Uh, okay, so this is a video. This is a really old video. It's an oldie but a goodie. Um, it shows just how quickly I had to work uh, and what I used. Um, this is actually one video of a series called Wild in the Streets, and it was shot by a great group of guys called the Dega Films. Uh, this was about 10 years ago now, my God. But um, so the, the Dega film crew decided to uh, follow a bunch of street artists uh, around and document how they do it. So there was myself, there was L, there was Enzo and Neo, there was a bunch, you can find it all online, it's all on YouTube if you wanna find it. Uh, but um, all right, I guess play a few seconds just so you could see how it works. So Jilly, can we put this in full screen before we play sure. it? Sure. Sure. Does that work? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So this is the uh if you're familiar with the L train going into Brooklyn. Hopefully it's not too loud. That's a very young me. <laughs> And that's it. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's all it takes. Um, and then you time it between trains, which is something I would do. This is very dramatic opening in my apartment in Greenpoint. Oh my God, badass, whatever, blah. So, so this was a side project. Um, this, which is the policy advisories. Uh, this is something maybe Jody's familiar with where um, 10 years ago, this is what the announcements would look like on uh, platforms if there was gonna be a change in um, uh, in any type of service. So at the time it was like this blue beige color. So I kind of borrowed that and then I um, up gave a modern take on old idioms and wise sayings. So this is in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 megabytes. And then there was one where uh, what doesn't kill you will most likely try again. It was just like something like that, like a modern twist on um, old things. So there you go. And that's the cam. That was my solution. It's um, 3M77. It was just in a hardware store, it was under 20 bucks, easy to use. Uh, this is another side project that I uh, would do every now and then, which is take the um, Apple, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, <laughs> the Apple design and then uh, respond to an ad in the subway, basically, and then apply it. Intellectual property, that's it. So how many, how many laws can we break in one day? Let's find out. <laughs> So we put up like a dozen small pieces. Uh, I love these little these little plaques. They're about they're about twelve inches wide. But you get the idea. Spray the back, put it up, and just walk away, basically. So, all right. Uh, yeah, so 
that's pr pretty much how it went <laughs> for about 12 years. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, with that little can, uh, just commuting, just by commuting to my job, to wherever. Um, I just stumble upon some architecture, uh, signage, and that would really just inspire me to want to work with that with that environment. I wanted to work with it. I didn't want to overpower it. I just wanted the piece just to fit seamlessly in. I love the Broadway one. Sorry to interrupt, Julie, but I love that to, to that point exactly, right? Or or this this one as well, right? But like that Broadway piece works because <laughs> it's that sign, right? Yeah. That doesn't work as well in Bedford. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah, just by commuting, I would I would be inspired. Um, and then the opposite is true while doing my deep dives, I would find an image and then have that in the back of my mind and see something, uh, where I'd like, oh, I know exactly what I could put in this, in this spot, you know, like, uh, perfect. I know exactly what to use. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. What can I say? I mean, also this was a, one of my faves. Just adding this guy to the Andy Warhol. <laughs> it was up for days. They they couldn't even tell if it was a part of the art or not. So that was great. Um, but yeah, uh, working with uh, responding to ads directly that was a thing. Um, but I guess yeah, I guess that's the end of my segment. You can do questions if you like. We got like four minutes or so. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jilly, for sharing your work and RJ and Jody for sharing yours. This was really fantastic, a fantastic presentation all around. Um, if you have any questions for our panelists, now is the time to either drop them in the chat or the Q&A box um, so that we can um, answer them together. Um, I did have two questions. Um, one uh, is that they'd like to hear a little bit more information about our exhibits. So uh, Mass Vigilantes on Silent Motorbikes is uh, open uh, through February 13th, uh, and it is located at Poster House, which is in Chelsea on 23rd Street between 6th and 7th, literally right across the street from the Home Depot that Julie went to uh, for their first um, install. Um, and we are open Thursday through Sunday uh, from 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. Uh, with extended hours every Friday. Um, and again, you have until February 13th uh, to see this excellent exhibition. Jody, do you want to tell them about um, your exhibit? Uh, yeah, so Towards a Better Way is on view at the Brooklyn location of the New York Transit Museum. It's down on the platform where the trains are, so you can't miss it. Uh, we are open also Thursday through Sunday, and I can't remember exactly what our business hours are now. I think it's 10 to 4. Uh, I, I think our public programs manager is in the chat, so she will correct me. Yes, 10 to 4. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's ongoing. I don't know. It's, it's going to be there until they tell me to think of something else to put in that space. So, uh, but uh, it's, it's a very small part of uh, the history of wayfinding and maps in the New York City transit system, but it was a really fun part to just pull out and have a deeper dive with. So, and plus I get to tell people about Joan, which uh, now more people know who she is, which is pretty great. So, so come visit us. It's fantastic. Okay, so the questions are rolling in. We are running out of time, but I'm hoping we can get through as many as we can before we have to sign off. Um, first question is, when does the artist take on creation of art cross over to be undisputed vandalism? Jill, you want to start that one? I mean, I, I could go on for days. I can answer that question for days, so. Um, yeah, it's, in the, it's in the eye of the beholder, how, how far it can go. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I was, I've been arrested for writing three letters on a poster that was considered enough vandalism to warrant arrest. So, uh, but, um, it is in the eye of the beholder, honestly, but, uh, what do you have to say, RJ? I mean, are we talking legally or ethically, right? I mean, legally speaking, 
yeah, you draw a mustache on a on an ad, you're vandalizing it. Ethically speaking, I, I think I get every right to do that. Now we can have a long debate about that. But I, so, and it can be both, right? Like plenty of things, just because something is vandalism does not mean that it's, I mean, if I, I don't know, if I was a PETA activist and I splashed paint on somebody's fur coat, um, that's definitely, I don't think the activist is gonna say that's not vandalism, right? It's definitely still vandalism. Uh, I mean, we saw that recently with uh, like the Russian embassy, right? Got somebody spray painting with a fire extinguisher all over it. Um, it's vandalism. Actually, that was the point. It was also a really interesting piece of activism and maybe art too, right? Um, so I just don't think there's that dichotomy necessarily. I think it's okay if they're both. Yeah, great question. Um... see another question that we had um is um why are the IRT and BMT BRT's designations still used internally by the MTA I think that's a great question uh you know that saying old habits die hard uh that's exactly why um it's just one of those things that even though it has not been a necessity for decades now uh, those designations didn't even leave the subway map until uh, 1979. So, you know, if if unification happens in 1940 and you're still seeing it in subway maps and signage until the 70s, like why, why? You know, I remember as a kid, and maybe Julie does also. Um, I remember if if you listen to like AM radio, like 1010 Winds would talk about delays on the IRT or delays on the BMT, and for someone like me, I didn't know what the difference was. I just knew, you know, when, oh, you're talking about the IRT, you must be talking about the two train, you know? So, you know, it, you don't, it's it's one of those things. It's on sign, signs in the comm centers. Yeah, I don't get it. I think it's never gonna go away. Um, yeah, and I think that that's also just like a common convention when you're working anywhere really, right? Is that the internal language that you use is not always a one for one match with the public facing language that you use. And yeah, a lot of that, with yeah. any industry, with publishing, it's like that, you know, people still talk about, still talk about, you know, paste ups when mm -hmm. I don't think anybody has actually, at a magazine, has actually pasted anything up in maybe 30 years. Uh, right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, okay. Um, Julie, I think this question is for you. Uh, how do you work or think about your collaborative work compared to like your solo work? That's a great question. Um, so usually it's, uh, there are just so many, so many great street artists that, uh, I know they're going to bring something that I could never bring to the table. So when I when I'm collaborating, uh, I'll I'll bring the best of my ability of the, the best of my knowledge <laughs> to the table, and uh, I work on just harmonizing it with the other artist. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I I feel like when I work, collaborate with another artist like Al Diaz or uh, um, JPO or uh, Olek, I've, there was just so many, so many, so many artists, Dave Navarro that I've collaborated with. Um, it's one of those things where you can't really explain how it comes together, but it does. Uh, and it kind of unifies the piece. It makes it whole. Um, so usually when I'm just collaborating with an artist, uh, I bring the best of my ability and they bring the best of theirs and we just see what happens, basically. Wonderful. What a great way to think of collaborations. I also, I'm curious, um, this is just my own personal question. Um, some of the images that you showed us also had graffiti already on, on where you had pasted your work. Um, how much of that was intentional versus just like taking advantage of like the moment? Um, yeah, um, that's definitely one of the motivations to use the space is how it's already decaying how it's already been, you know, vandalized already. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that's part of the, uh, that's, that's part of the environment. Yeah, like that little boy um, on one of the garbage dumps, dumpster things, 
uh, all, all of that graffiti was already there. And I, just, I, th I thought it would be a nice framework around him. Yeah, great. Um, so this question is uh, for, for Jody, but I guess like I, anyone can really like chime in. Um, so Mass Vigilantes is definitely like a departure for Poster House in terms of our exhibition. And I know RJ often um, questions like even the, um, the, the validity of having Poster House having an exhibition that is explicitly anti-advertising in our space. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about like how does advertising function in uh, a space like the subway where direct communicate where clear and direct communication right as we saw in in your two comparative images is like imperative to the process um and then how do our interventions like Jilly's sort of like complicate this well one thing i would like to point out is that there has been advertising in the subway since it opened in 1904 uh, and prior to the opening of the subway, when the stations were being built, there was a lot of discussion about whether they should build spaces for advertising to go. And it was a very heated debate, as you might imagine. And, you know, advertising was nowhere near as pervasive as it is now back then. It was not as pervasive back then as it is now. So, you know, this is it, it is a conversation worth having and it's a question worth asking, you know, and now that now that no matter where we go anywhere whether it's the subway on the street you know there's advertising everywhere you can't escape it i can't think of any ad free spaces off the top of my head except maybe for houses of worship and even that might not be the case um so you know um and and there's a constant question about what sorts of advertising should be allowed in the subway. Um, and there are very specific rules that the MTA and the New York City Transit Authority has about what ads are permissible. Um, there's not that many rules, but um, and off the top of my head, I can't remember. I, they, they're all on the website. It's transparency. So anybody could look them up. But um, certain types of language are not allowed, like uh, you can't use curse words or you know, generally accepted curse words. Um, you, you are not really supposed to promulgate hate speech. And um, uh, uh, recently uh, in the past two years, I think it was, maybe it was three, uh, by law in New York City, the New York City transit uh, system cannot advertise uh, alcohol. That's a fairly recent, uh, recent development. Smoking ads were, were uh, disallowed quite some time ago. But alcohol is relatively new, and the point was made when that decision was was when the it was brought up for decision uh, at an MTA board meeting was that ads for alcohol were usually juxtaposed with ads for other types of products that might be appealing to children, and that would and you pay for ad space and don't necessarily get to stay where the ads go within that space. Uh, so, you know. I can understand why nowadays it is more visible that people have been artistically reacting to advertisements, uh, but I it it's it's been happening since the system opened. So it's interesting to see how that particular evolution has happened with the artistic reaction to ads. Uh, I'm not going to call it graffiti because it's not always graffiti. Graffiti is the act of writing and that's not what all of this is. So interesting. Uh, that's all I can really say about it. Yeah, uh, Julia or RJ, I don't know if either of you wanted to chime in uh, or we can move on to the next question. I mean, I'll just I'll, I'll say it's interesting, the alcohol thing, right? Because I I I had forgotten or I didn't know that, that particular change, but certainly, you know, you hear about these controversies every year or so with, oh, is that ad allowed? Is this ad allowed? Right. And like there are determinations being made. And I guess I'll say from my biased position of I'm an independent curator, I can say whatever I want. Right. Like, uh, you know, represent any institutions. I would say, you know, it's interesting that these we're making these determinations. So we're acknowledging in some sense that that at least some ads are not healthy for us. Um, and I guess I would just, I think the artists that are in mass vigilantes, I think Jilly, you'd, you'd fall into this camp probably of maybe there are artists and activists who are saying, maybe we should have a broader array of ads that aren't considered healthy without, at least for the general public, without choosing to opt into them. 
So interesting the debate is happening. Absolutely. Um, I got another question uh, here. Um, is there a meaningful difference between artistic uh, vandalism and activist vandalism? It, um, for example, the no Nazi signs put up next to the no smoking signs versus the fake see something, say something signs. And why is the subway the most appropriate place for either intervention? I mean, I'd love to say to that, you know, you know, so, some of those people, some of the people doing this like fake, uh, if you see something, say something signs actually do consider themselves artists, right, as well as activists, but, but good, but good question, right, like, is there a line here? I don't know if there's like, I can't give an answer on where that line is, I can say a lot of people fall into both camps, but why the subway, you know, as, as everyone's been saying tonight, there's so much iconic content in the subway. So if you can insert your message into that iconic visual language, be it the maps or the the no smoking or the, you know, throw your trash here signs, A, you can slip through the cracks. In some circumstances, you can slip through the cracks, like with Jilly and the Warhol, right? Like people maybe didn't notice, but those who's, who did notice, suddenly a switch goes off in your brain, like, oh my gosh, they messed with that iconic visual language. And I have to think for a second if it's legit or not, and engage with it and this it's, it's a powerful way to engage with the existing infrastructure and a way to sort of insert yourself into it so it's it's, a, it's been an effective tool for half a century essentially doing something like that other thoughts no um okay this this is a an a needy question, um, and I don't know that we're going to come to a concise answer today, but it's interesting, so I'm going to ask ask it. Um, and I apologize if I um, mispronounce any of the names, but uh, Taranak, uh, who designed the 1979 map, I mispronounced it, I can see from Jody's reaction. No, I'm not laughing. You, you pronounced his name correctly. I'm just laughing because I think I know what this question is going to be. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, and Vignelli, who designed the 1972 map, were both authoritarians who believed that they, and not the writers, could decide on the shape of the map. Um, how are these artistic interventions any different? Uh, and when does the humble writer get to have a say in what they see on the subway? Wow, that is that is not the question I thought it would be. Um, uh, and I'm kind of glad. Um, but um, I... To speak to the first part of the question, which is really what I can only only what I can speak about, is that, you know, the it, saying saying that Tarnak designed the map or that Vignelli designed the other map that's that's kind of a misnomer because uh, they were all they were all kind of designed by committee, um, especially the 1979 map went through a lot of changes and a lot of stylistic and like like uh, theoretical discussions. Um, you know, the short answer is that there is no perfect subway map and there can never be one because the diversity of information that commuters need cannot be expressed in one single object like a map, which is why people have so much fun drawing new ones every day. Uh, and so I would imagine that perhaps the intervention artists or the activist uh, in, intervent, art, artistic activist interventions with our subway system and transit system and advertising in general is kind of the same thing, right? Um, in some ways where there's a myriad of topics that people would like to talk about and there is no one graphic representation of all of these issues. So that's, you know, uh, my my grandmother used to say every pot has a cover, and that's kind of like you know there there's there's an artistic expression for everyone you know there's a different subway map for everyone's taste so um, maybe that's a little bit too reductive but <laughs> you know it's it's all of these issues that we've talked about tonight uh, are a lot more similar than it would seem on the surface because everybody wants something specific from the subway map uh, and people who are exposed to advertising and th they want something, some kind of satisfaction 
either way for either like they want to buy the product or they hate the idea of the product and they want to put something on the ad that tells people don't don't do this and that's why new york is pretty great because we have space for everybody who's who's got all these different opinions about everything uh sorry uh that's maybe overstep my bounds a little bit there uh so rj and jilly maybe you should uh chime in well i'm happy to um, also I mean, no go ahead please. i'm sorry i mean i think peter that's a great question uh i would say jilly is the humble writer you know and like if that you know if i if i go in with i'm just gonna take the mustache example again if i go in with the marker in the subway and draw a mustache on somebody's face am i am i not doing that because i'm bored and the g train got delayed again and i'm stuck in between stations right um and and i think most of the artists doing this kind of work whether they be doing it from an activist bent or they're just graffiti writers and they you know they want to get their name up these are not this is not coca-cola right like i would agree with you on the advertisers but this is jilly is not coca-cola uh and often what somebody like Jilly or Jordan Seiler is doing in the subway is almost, it's, you know, they're mess, you're messing with, let's say messing with one subway stop, one advertisement, one piece of signage, not thousands of advertisements, right? You're almost proposing, hey, this is what I'd love for the whole system to be, but I'm going to do it once, twice, three times in these little spots. Um, the actual effect <laughs> is in, ter in terms of, I don't know, disrupting somebody's commute in terms of like, oh no, now I'm lost is pretty minimal, right? Um, how much damage, let's call it, or creative energy can one person put into the subway system? Uh, not all that much. So, uh, you know, no offense to Jilly or the other artists who do it. I mean, there's just a level of, there's a practical question here. Um, so at the end of the day, yeah, I would I would say that those, those folks doing those interventions are the humble riders. And if you feel like you need to say something in the subway system, you know, there's spray paint, there's markers, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's posters, you, you know, make it happen <laughs> or, or don't, don't, no, not legal advice, not legal advice. <laughs> Julie, any thoughts you wanted to add on that question? Yeah, um, that was perfectly said. Uh, I was hoping, you know, my segment would be just as educational you know, and, and inspirational. Um, but yeah, uh, the subway is incredible and it feels like it's uh, it's just calling out for us to interact with, so. I think when you called it beautiful and disgusting at the same time, it, it, it you kind of summed it up because you have this great public work that has some fantastic work from real artisans of their era, you know, mosaic designers, mosaic tile, tile, layer, tile setters, you know, uh, and, and all the ornamentation means something, but people today may not realize what the meaning behind some of the ornamentation is because it's from the turn of the 1900s. So like that, that is kind of lost. And it is beautiful, but it's also New York is a dirty city mm -hmm. and things get dirty here. And that's that's the dichotomy of New York, really. It's beautiful and it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and that's why I love I love the work that I do at the New York Transit Museum is because I get to talk about both sides of it and. And hear what other people have to say, you know. And so thank you for expressing that because that's really, that's everything, right? It's beautiful and disgusting. There you go. Absolutely. Um, wonderful. So there's just two last questions that I want to be able to get through and then we can sign off. Thank you uh, to our panelists for staying a little over our time. And thank you to the folks who have stayed on for this Q&A, which is the majority of the folks who joined this call. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts on explicit MTA com collaborations with advertisers, such as like the Supreme Subway card? Um, yeah, although I don't know like the mechanics of how different that is from just like a normal ad buy, but. 
I mean, I thought it was fun. I like as somebody who doesn't like advertising on the subway, I personally was like, yeah, there's like worse ads on the subway. It's weird that everybody's it's being annoying, but um, it it was I, I didn't get one. But like, cool, if this gets a bunch of people into the subway, a bunch of hype beasts into the subway who were taking Ubers before that, like, sure, fine. Right. Like, I don't know, I guess. Did, did it did the supreme ads actually advertise to anybody right or was it really just something that a bunch of supreme people who already love supreme went and got their mta you know cards you know i don't think that sold any t-shirts i guess that's what i'm saying yeah any other thoughts mm. For me, it sort of reminds me of like the ongoing conversation and the mass vigilantes exhibition, which is like what happens when the thing that you are appropriating or like challenging is then asking you to become a part of that. Um, so I think that there's like an interesting uh, comparison between those two. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have time to dive into any deeper um but I do want to leave with this last question, which um, there, uh, Julie, there's, uh, by the very nature of your work, it's ephemeral, right? Meaning that it's like temporary and, and passing. Um, does it hurt to see when the things you've uh, put up get taken down? <laughs> um, believe it or not, no, it doesn't, it does not hurt. It doesn't. Um, that's just part of the experience uh, as part of the life cycle of putting work uh, in the subway. It will not last. Um, it will be taken down. You don't know when, uh, uh, but it's interesting just to see a piece as it goes up and then slowly be chipped away or uh, be completely torn down and there's only like a fraction of it. Um, that's just all part of the experience. And, uh, you know, you could always put up another piece, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. On that note, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists, uh, Jody, Jilly, RJ. Thank you so much. This has been such a fun and energizing conversation. Um, I had a lot of fun and I learned a lot and I know our audience did too. Thank you so much for being here and sharing uh, your work with us this evening. Um, and come to the Transit Museum, come to Poster House. We'd love to see you. Um, absolutely. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.